to hold in my hands a podcast that contains such power. That power would put me up above the gods. And through the science of audio, I shall have that power. G'day audiophiles, you are listening to The Sirens of Audio, the podcast that explores the universe of Doctor Who and the audio medium. My name is Dwayne. And my name is Philip. G'day audiophiles, g'day Dwayne. G'day Philip. Uh, we've got a great show lined up today. We're going to be talking with uh, another Big Finish writer, which we always love to do. This is this time it will be Tim Foley, so that's a good one coming up. But Philip, you're looking very refreshed and free there. How are you going up there in Sydney now that lockdowns uh, opened up this week? Or well, finish this week. <laughs> well, yeah, the worst of lockdowns are but uh, we've still got fairly strict rules in terms of what we can and can't do and where we, we can and can't go. But we can now travel the city uh, and go out. And I did two Marvel films last night with my son because there were the two ones we missed during lockdown. And we've got a, a cinema at the moment who's going through all the movies that should have been on for the last four months. So, uh, yeah, I got out and sat in the movie theatre with a mask on and had a great time. Excellent. All right, well, let's get straight into it, eh? Before we talk to Tim, do you know what I see? I see a rabbit hole, Philip. Let's go! (laughs) Okay, so, Philip, we're going to be talking with Tim because his latest release... Uh, is the Clone Masters. He wrote all three episodes of the Clone Masters. So I want to get your thoughts on the Blake 7 range. Do, do you remember the BBC releases from the 90s? Did you ever listen to those? I think there was two uh, releases. Okay. that Yeah, they were set during something... season four. The Cinderton Experiment, was it? And the Something Crown. The Sevenfold seven fold Crown. That's crown. right. That's right. I, I have them both on tape in my cupboard. Do you recall anything about them? I do remember they weren't very good. <laughs> well, it, it was very interesting because um, Dana, if I recall correctly, I think Dana was recast by... Angela Bruce. Angela Bruce, who plays uh, Brigadier Bambera in Battlefield. So, and I think um, there is another recast as well. Was Sue Lin recast as well? I can't. Re- I can't recall. But it, it was it, almost it, like most of the cast was recast for actually, these ones. I'm pretty sure all the women had been recast. The men were the same, but the women had been recast. So yes, that that does sound right now. And Which and is- Jan, Jan Chapel wasn't there because it was set during season four. So that that solved that little issue. But, um, yeah, you don't remember too much about them? A very vague memory. It's been a long... Actually, you've, you've made piqued my curiosity now. I'm thinking I should have another listen to them. But it's been a long time. I've got them somewhere on cassette, like you said, and uh, it would mean I'd have to go and dig around. But I, I happened to listen to them on Audible the other day, just the preview. I just looked them up and listened to the preview. And, yes, you're right. The um, a very, very stark difference in quality between the 90s and well even when no no the Blake 7 only started in uh, in the last decade didn't they with Big Finish so there was quite a gap between them my, my memory if my memory serves me I think the thing that got me was they they weren't like Blake 7 stories right so particularly I'm just telling you that the crown one the sevenfold crown my my, my impression of that and my memory is that it wasn't Blake 70 at all in terms of tone or there, there were okay stories. They had kind of had the characters who weren't properly drawn or written, and the stories just weren't Blake Seventy. But it has been decades since I've listened to it, so I really should be careful how much I judge. And there was another couple of was sort of semi fan produced audios as well. Uh, I think one was called "The Logic of Empire," 
And there was another one about Travis as well with, with Brian Croucher. And they were produced, I think they were produced by Alan Stevens, who did who eventually did Caldor City. But these ones were a different production company. I think it was before uh, Magic Bullet Productions came along. Do you recall those? I must confess I don't remember those ones at all. Yeah, if, if anyone remembers those, drop us a comment if you're watching on YouTube or send us an email, sirensofaudio at gmail.com. Let us know your memories of those particular recordings. There were the, the, the two official BBC ones and the um, the ones that weren't produced by the BBC. So um, I, I'm keen to go back and listen to uh, to all of those, actually. We might have to have a listen to them and, and talk about them later. But we're talking lots about Blake Seven. How how are you going with the with the new ranges, big finish wise? Uh, the world's a big finish. How's it? How are you all finding it? Uh, all these new ideas that they're coming up with. Yeah, I'm loving the worlds. I I guess when poor Daryl died, I thought it was well, it was tragic because he's a great man to be to have lost. But to me, I thought that was going to be the end of the Blackstone range. I didn't didn't occur to me what they could do, and the fact that they've gone sideways and they're managing to still bring in. Uh, the surviving cast members in new and interesting ways. Uh, I've, I've been loving it. I mean, the Clone Masters particularly, I thought was another great success. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, I loved what they did with Avalon, the character. I'm looking forward to hearing more. Hopefully there'll be more of that. Baben coming up and they're bringing Michael Keating into that and more Sullen event. So yeah, I think they found a really clever way to actually bring back the original cast and tell new stories, which is you know, what Big Finish is all there for. Yeah, I, I I must admit I'm with you too. I thought that was it. Once Paul Darrow passed away, I thought there was no there was no way around it. But I'm really happy that they're that they've gone ahead with this. And it's interesting, particularly the Clone Masters. Normally we're we're used to hearing John Ainsworth and Scott Hancock dealing with these uh, rangers, but we've got a, a a difference with this one in that it's Lisa Bauman who has a different directorial style again. Which is very no- very noticeable. After speaking with her early in the year, there were certain elements of her direction that I definitely picked up from the Clone Masters. So maybe we can talk a bit more about that with Tim when he uh, when he comes on. Sounds good. All right, let's get out of this rabbit hole. We'll be back with Tim Foley in just a moment. Oh, what is it? There's no one on reception because reception's been smashed to pieces. From Big Finish Productions, the worlds of Blake Seven, the Clone Masters. Jenna Stannis. Hello, Hinton. How wonderful to see you again. You've barely changed. I'm under commission from a Clone Master. A Clone Master? Their ruler has died. Sound the bells. The Queen of the Clone Masters is dead. There's quite the power struggle underway on their homeworld. If I can help them ascend to the throne, the Resistance might have a powerful new friend. Stop all this! Stop all this at once! Travis, I didn't think we would make quite so dramatic an entrance. It's you! No! No! Keep back! This is a research base that specialised in cloning. She thought she recognised you. She called you Lara. It cannot be a coincidence that there is some sort of connection to both the Clone Masters and the Aurons. Commander Travis, I am currently with so a patient. you know who I am? Of course I do. Travis, Space Commander, Alpha 15105. You shouldn't have come here. It's not safe. We must make a hasty exit. Come on! Okay, that does it. I believe I'd make a worthy commanding officer. (laughs) Do you really? I'm Space Commander Travis. I am destined for great things. What are you doing? Ah! You have an hour on in your crew, don't you? Callie. Why are you asking? Because I came across an unusual hour on myself. Alara Kay. Big finish. We love stories.
So that was a clip from the Clone Masters, and we now have here the writer of that wonderful story, Tim Foley. Tim, welcome to The Sirens of Audio. Well, thanks very much for having me. It's great to have you. Tell, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you? Where do you live? And tell us a bit about growing up too. Um, well, yes, so I'm, uh, I am a writer based in Manchester at the moment, which is the northwest of England. But I'm originally from the northeast of England, so it felt like a bit of a betrayal crossing that barrier between the different Norths. Um, yeah, I guess, uh, you know, I have a very sort of typical origin story, big Doctor Who fan as a kid. It wasn't initially on telly when I was younger, but I accidentally saw um, uh, UK gold repeats being recorded by my uncle. Um, it was back in the day when if you're recording something on VHS, you can't change the channel. So he said, you know, you're either watching this or you're watching nothing. So I was like, okay, I'll give this a go. And it was The Face of Evil. What a story to begin with. Loved it. And then he was like, oh, well, I've got um, Robots of Death and Talons of Wang Chiang already recorded if you want to make a day of it. And I was like, mm, yeah, yeah, I think I will. So, yeah, since then I was hooked. Then about, um, let's see, it'd be sort of like midway through my secondary school, uh, age-wise, it's, I guess, like sort of like 14 Doctor Who came back on telly and something that had been a very sort of, you know, private, personal, geeky thing for me was suddenly shared by um, all my classmates. We all just sort of fell head over heels in love with Christopher Eccleston, Billy Piper. So, um, yeah, and I think Doctor Who is one of the reasons I write as well. There was something about it's like imagination, um, just the endless stories it could tell. So when I then went off to uni and then there was this sort of... Um, there was a way of getting out writing essays if instead you wrote short plays and that seemed like the easier thing to do. So I was like, yeah, I'll give that a go. And that's when I first put pen to paper. And then since then, I've been writing for the last 10 years, mainly to do with sort of theatre, but obviously with Big Finish for the last ooh, five years, maybe. I've been doing a lot of audio stuff for them and yeah, greatly enjoying it. What was your first professional work? That was my first professional work. Well, in um, in university, I did a lot of the Edinburgh Fringe where we would just sort of go on mass every summer and take some terrible things I wrote, some some honestly abominable things. But that was a lovely sort of safe space to sort of fail and make friends and be like, hey, you know, theatre is a sort of creative communal thing. But the first thing, the first professional thing I did was a play called The Dogs of War, which was in... Let's see, that was 2013, and that was in a theatre pub, which is a thing you have in London. I was living in London at the time, um, which is just like a room above a pub, like seats 50, 60 people. And that ran for a month, and that got um, a bit of interest. It won an award, and things just sort of, sort of spiralled on from then. Do you find it's hard to have a career as a writer? Yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, I think any the things that writers need are time and space and money. And I don't think society at the moment is organised well enough to allow writers and creatives in general to have those three things at any one time. I was very, very lucky that after my first play, which um, I, I was so broke during that I started working at the pub underneath it at the time to sort of pay rent so which led to some very awkward situations where people would come down from the theatre and I'd be like how was the play just pulling the pints and they had no idea or has anything to do with it but um after that play I was lucky enough to get this um extravagant channel for playwright and residence bursary which just gives you a wad of cash and connects you with a the theatre where you sort of live for a year and so that following year I had time and space and money and it did wonders for me. It sort of just gave me this sort of breathing space to be working on a lot of projects, um, some of which, even all those years ago, are still sort of coming into fruition now because theatre moves very slowly. But it just allowed me that space to have this sort of big, to create a catalogue, I guess, of sort of work and weird theatre things. But yeah, I think I think it is tough. I think it is very tough. The pub that you refer to, is that the one that you mentioned uh, in the Clone Masters that you... <laughs> we're pulling pints there and then you went back and watched episodes of Blake seven after, after shifts there at that pub. Yes, it was. I, I, I forgot I'd mentioned that. Yes. Yeah. That, that was the pub with, um, yeah, it was very late shifts, work late into the night. And then when I get back, I'd be like, yeah, I want to switch on 
some old sci-fi television and Blake Seven was the one of choice. I think, I don't know if I mentioned on the extras, I also did sort of Sapphire and Steel at the same time. And yeah, it was, I mean, it was great. I, again, it, it, it then... Um, it then led to a situation which was similar to my very early Doctor Who days because I wanted to talk to lots of people or my flatmates about Blake Seven. And of course, none of them had seen it because I was watching it at like 3 a.m. in the morning. So I'd be sort of describing st- strange moments of the episodes, half remembering them as well. So I've got a lot of friends who've like vaguely heard of Blake Seven as a result. So you could sit down and watch anything. What What's the sort of viewing that you like to do? It's a bit mixed at the moment. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I think lockdown as well exacerbated what everybody's watching and we're all going um, overdrive on our viewing. I've just finished a viewing for the first time of Star Trek Voyager. I'd never seen much Star Trek as a kid. But when I got this massive uh, bursary and lived in a farm for a year, I watched as much as I could of Star Trek Next Generation. And I only finished that a few years ago. And now I was like, what should I move on to next? And I'd heard that Deep Space Nine is the best one. So I was like, I better hold on to that one. It is the best. Save that, save that for a rainy day. I'll move on to Voyager. Um, had a great time with it. It's a very strange show. I can see um, I can see the shadow of a better show inside of it. But I love some of the characters. Loved particularly what they did with the Doctor's journey. Um, that sort of, you know hologram becoming a real human being i really enjoyed that so yeah that's what i've just finished at the moment or other things like anything by mike flanagan the midnight mass i've just watched recently or the haunting a hill house it's quite an eclectic mix i think as a writer you have to be a bit of a sponge and watch lots of stuff read lots of stuff that's what i tell myself anyway so who who do you like to read um at the moment i guess we're in slightly spooky season i'm going through a lot of short stories i think i've got brain power for that better so I've just finished a Daphne du Maurier collection. Um, she's great. I don't know where she's been all my life. Um, before then, it was a, there was some Shirley Jackson that sort of coincided when I was watching the TV stuff. Um, I'm moving on to the British Library do this wonderful thing where they reprint um, weird tales of sort of lesser known authors. So I've got one called uh, a writer called Eleanor Scott waiting for me, which uh, I'll be reading soon. So, yeah, I mean, again, I'm very sort of seasonal. I'll be reading Christmas stories, no doubt, in a few months' time, and then, you know, depressing spring stories a few months after that. So, yeah. You should try and get some Edgar Allan Poe in while you're doing your freaky stuff. Oh, classic, yeah. I mean, actually, I just reread Mask of the Red Death maybe like a week ago. That was in like a little volume that I was reading, which I'd never actually read. I'd seen the Roger Corman film, and actually... Talking to Claw Masters, I used him slightly as a touchstone um, for moments, which we can talk about later. But uh, yes, no, I, I, I didn't realise how short Mask of the Red Death is as a story in it. It packs in so much. Very impressive. Hmm. So where, where did this passion for reading, writing come from? I guess, I, I guess again, I, I wonder if I can connect it to sort of Doctor Who in the sense that having watched a sort of TV show that nobody else was really watching at the time before it came back, and trying to discover other forms of its media. I would, you know, go around our charity shops here, which I don't know if you guys have, but they're great, always stock with books. And I would always pick up the Doctor Who Target books or even the Doctor Who, um, sort of the Eighth Doctor range or the Virgin New Adventures stuff. And um, yeah, I, I can I find myself just sort of falling down little rabbit holes. I think I've done that all my life. And I think we, you know, there's there's maybe lots of us who, you know, at the age of 15 will read one Sherlock Holmes short story and be like, you know what, I shall read them all. And uh, yeah, I definitely have that sort of mindset. So I guess that's where it comes from. So you're a completist? Anything you start, you have to finish everything? I definitely used to be. I think um, the older I get, the more I can acknowledge, you know, maybe some things aren't for me or if I'm not enjoying something, I can sort of take it easy. Um and again, I can use the sort of, you know, writer excuse of, oh, I should move on to something else. I should be absorbing other things. So, so yeah. So at which point did you realise when someone say to you, you have a talent for writing? Oh, I didn't, I didn't realise that for quite a while. Well, I had a very, um, I had a very lovely tutor at university who was already always very nice about the assignments I would hand in. And I did really click with the process. And so I wasn't always necessarily thinking of, the 
product, I guess, not to use overly capitalist terms, but um, like I was saying about the Edinburgh Fringe, I think it was really important to fail there and be a bit rubbish and mess up and try things. Um, and I think it was only when I, you know, put my knapsack on my back and moved to London and started joining sort of writer clubs there and going to see um, other theatre players that I thought, yeah, maybe I could do this. And then after my first play went on, I mean, it's, it's always it's always baby steps, I guess, with any sort of writing career. There's no, or at least there hasn't been for me, there's no one big moment where, you know, the great doors just magically open. It feels like every time you're making a big leap, it's actually more of a baby step, but that's actually a good thing and just sort of like creeping along. And yeah, I think I think less than other people telling me that I'm okay, which doesn't happen that often, but I've, I've learned to sort of, you know, you find a sort of quiet confidence in yourself where you're saying, yeah, I can do that. And I will have fun doing that. I think that's more important. Um, so how was it that you, so you run lots of plays. How did Big Finish come along? Was that part of, yeah, how, how did that come along? Yeah, that was me being a bit cheeky because, like I said, I'd, I'd, written, I'd written plays, I'd, you know, had a couple of awards. And I did used to listen to Big Finish a fair bit back when um, back was in, I was in school. And I was following one of the producers on Twitter, Scott Hancock. And I sent him a little message being like, hey, I'm a writer. Uh, very cocky now. And I'm surprised I did it. But I'm also glad I did because it kept me in mind. That was like a, like a year later. He then came back and was like, um, do you want to pitch for Torchwood and Gallifrey? And I was hugely excited for Gallifrey because that was a series I'd listened to a lot. And I was, at the time, a little indifferent to Torchwood because I was like, oh, I haven't seen that TV show in a while but I'll see what they're going to do and he sent me these pitch documents and it was the uh, Tortured Among Us series and it just felt really exciting it felt like you know writing for an actual series the the planning they put in for the characters the little quotes they had in the pitch document from Russell T Davies it felt like this sort of like show bible and yeah and uh, so I was very lucky that they said yes to both my pitches for that and so then I had a lovely Christmas just as I was leaving the farm theatre, I think it was, where I was writing for both Brax and uh, the Torture Crew. So that was wonderful. So you were actually writing both stories at the same time. You, you got both pictures. Mm. Yeah, and I, and I think that's actually been useful training for later in my Big Finish career when you do have multiple projects on the go. You actually get into this lovely rhythm where you're working on something and then you may be you know, a little fatigued by it or tired by it or something's not quite working. And instead of switching off completely, you can move on to another script. Um, so I like to make sure, or I hope to make sure, that if I take on a couple of commissions, they're quite different, feeling quite different. And I think that's something that really worked as well for the Clone Masters. When I was talking to the script editor, Peter, he was like, make sure the episodes feel quite different in tone and approach. And that really helped because then it, you know, helped me write all three quicker. Yeah, the, the first story... Uh struck that I noticed you so I mean I know you'd written um from the gods among us for the torchwood and also the Gallifrey but they were just stories amongst box sets and I must admit you didn't stand out particularly but the one mm -hmm. that stood out for the first time for me and I noticed was um Night of the Fendal oh uh, right and that, that was one that sort of stood out for me because it's a combination of torchwood and Doctor Who and always that same period that you first started watching in the early Leela, Leela period um, uh -huh. how, how, how did that come about? Well, so after um, after having done a few Among Us things, and uh, you know, I, I take no offence in the lack of standing out, uh, in the sense that it was a new genre for me. I'd never really done any audio work before. But the great thing about writing for a box set is you get a freebie of the release, and you've got three other stories to listen to, and you can see what other people are doing. And I think that really helps sort of build your craft. So Night of the Fendal was maybe, I think, my first solo release my first monthly and uh yeah this just 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 came from a, a a wild suggestion from James Goss who is the king of Torchwood and has brilliant ideas and um it was very much uh we're going to do a classic Doctor Who series I mean um season with uh Torchwood and Eve really wants to do a horror absolute gruesome horror that's her bag and you'll notice a lot of the Eve releases I think are very horror orientated because she's a big fan of that stuff and yes it was um 
it was a it was a fairly tricky process um with no one to blame but there was lots of toing and froing and backing and forth and we we went a lot darker originally and then because uh, there was a doctor who monster in there there was you know a, 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 a toing and froing over the how dark we could go and um but yeah no I, i'm really glad i wrote for eve eve is an absolute riot in the studio that was one i could go and sit and listen to and um Oh, what a woman. What a talent as well. She was she was so yep. frightening in that story. Yeah, big fan. Would you like to introduce yourself for the camera? Hello, Gwen Cooper. I'm your victim. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions, Torchwood, Night of the Fendal. We have lived for one thing and one thing alone. We are mere cattle, morsels for our masters. This is the place, the actual place. This is where it happened all those years ago. And this is the altar. This is where I'm sacrificed. Uh, you are a glorious gift as we summon death itself. <coughs> I spin around forever. Say its name. Say its name. The Fendal. Big finish. We love stories. So I wasn't meaning to have a go in terms of not standing out for the box sets. Oh, no, 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 don't, don't worry at all. I, 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 mean, I, mean, I think part, part of the box, part of the part of the beauty of the box sets were they were obviously well engineered, might be the wrong word, but script edited and to have a similar tone with a similar theme. So mm-hmm. I think I think it's harder. What harder? Sometimes you don't actually want people to stand out <laughs> because yeah, you're, no, I, you're telling a progressive story. So <laughs> I was having a go. That... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I totally agree as well. In a box set as well. Another reason I like being part of a box set is because you, you are very much part of a team. There's lots of group chats and, you know, pre-COVID times you sort of meet up and maybe have a drink with um, it's a, it's a It's a big sort of team building exercise. And it, and it makes me think of the sort of more collaborative nature of theatre. I think doing a box set with other writers. So, so yeah, I'm glad I didn't stand up for that. Don't <laughs> One set that you worked on that I'm quite interested in because we haven't seen volume two, but the the seventh Doctor New Adventures, volume one, which was sort of there were new stories based on novel characters. What was the approach to that? Did you go back and read some of those novels yourself uh, to get familiar with the characters or did you just take the brief and, and work with what was uh, what was given to you by Big Finish? Yeah, that's a good one. So I, re- I had read a few new adventures when I was younger um, and I did then try and sort of dig out s- some of my old books um, when we came to this audio, but I couldn't find any ones that had Chris and Ros in. I had, lo- I had lots of um, Benny ones and I thought that would be sort of detrimental at first, but I had already listened to, at this point, I think, um, Damaged Goods. And um, it was fairly clear as well from the pitching document we got as well that they weren't exactly the characters from the novel. They were sort of slightly changed. Roz is maybe a little younger and they were sort of doing a slightly different approach. So, uh, so no, I didn't go back to the novels. But we also had Andy Lane overseeing the project as well as one of the original writers. So I felt sort of safe and comfortable in doing that. I am um, a big fan of that book set because it taught me a lot. I think I enjoy the script I wrote for that one, but I think the, the story is so much better than the script itself because of all the work that was done to it by Scott and the sound designer, who I forget the name of. I think it was maybe um, Johan. Um, they make it so much better. They, uh, they, the approach, it was the first time that I heard a story of mine and I thought, wow, they, they have really lifted this material and this is actually very frightening. There were some moments, I mean, there's jump scares, jump scares in audio. I didn't think that was possible. Yeah, and the, and the acting is just phenomenal. Yeah, I was, so I was very pleased with that one. And I hope there's a volume two too. That would be great. More stories by them. It was Joe Miners. To the yes, present. Joe Miners. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, exceptional work. It, 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 ever since that story, it's really made me appreciate what the sound designers actually do. Um, because I've always I've always respected directors because you do in theatre they're the ones who sort of 
not make the actors good. That sounds terrible. But they, but they, you know, they have the vision. They have the, they know how to get the performances. But the sound design is a big finish of the unsung talent. Some exceptional work there. Dead. 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 Now let's be gentle about how we tell the others. We don't want to start a panic. Oh. Are you going to say it or shall I? Come on. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions. Doctor Who. The Seventh Doctor New Adventures, Volume 1. I see three humans, two male, one female. They've got a thing with them. A thing? Be more precise. Okay. Three people and a box. An actual box. Those are rather big guns for one so young. That's a rather big mouth for one so old. Who are you? My friends, call me the Doctor. I didn't catch your names. I'm Ros Forrester. This is Chris Quetch. This is your challenge, a challenge quite different than any you may have faced before. When the timer runs out, your time runs out, unless you can find out how to escape. How charming! A mysterious island, a group of strangers, a dash of mathematics, and a dollop of inclement weather. <laughs> swim for shore! We have to swim for shore! Everyone, jump! Green! We voted against this! I can't protect you from a punishment if you disobey the vote. No, no, put that gun away! Please! Ah! Attack incoming! They're counting down. Five, four, three, two, two one! Big Finish. We love stories. Some things coming to play. So having worked for Gwen, vision for Gwen with image of the so Night of the Fendal, um, you then came back for Gwen again, and this time added Freema um, and Martha into the mix with Dissected. So yes. th- th- that that's a very important. You know, Freema's return to, to Big Finish was actually a fairly important, very important step. She had to enjoy the story, want to be there. How did you get that commission? Yeah, I know. I mean, why did they ask me? Again, it was it was James Goss out the blue suggesting, um, do you want to write for Martha? And I was like, uh, what? Me? Yes, absolutely. And um, yeah, I, I felt pressure. I definitely felt pressure. And there was a point during the writing it that I was worried that I'd done something a little too experimental um, because I don't know if you've heard it, but it's all effectively from the point of view of a dead body and they're yep. in one room yep. and... That's the kind of thing you can do on stage. And it's naturally, you know, it's a bit of a pot boiler. It's very tense, but it's, it's, it's hard to keep that momentum going on audio without the energy draining away. So I was writing it and being like, oh no, it's, it's, it's Freema's, it, Freema will only ever do this audio and I've messed it up. And I was like, well, wow. but um, no, again, having, having Scott Hancock, great horror director and um, James Goss by my side. I'm, top, I'm, I'm pleased with what we did and what we achieved. And again, they had a great time. That's very important to me. I like it when the actors have a good time. Um, but yeah, that was that was a wild one. There was also a, we didn't actually know 100% that we could get Freema. It was a slightly more speculative script where we were like, if you write a banging story, we'll put this in front of her. We'll see if we can get her. So the back of my mind, there was always the prospect that we would have to invent a new unit operative that sort of Gwen would be hanging out with. But I'm glad we didn't have to go down that route. So, yeah, very pleased. Dr. Martha Jones. Please don't use my full name. Makes me think there's trouble. From Big Finish Productions, Torchwood, Dissected. Let's get on with this. (laughs) Caucasian male, late teens, deceased. And I need to know what killed him. Okay. Thank you. Could you pass the scissors? I'll remove the clothes. Oh, I never liked this bit. What bit? Oh, I don't know, the beginning. You don't have any of the answers. or All you have is this, the trauma up front, you know? I just want to know what happened to him, this kid, who he was. But we'll find the truth. We'll find the truth tonight. Big finish. We love stories. I actually think that monthly range of Torchwood has just started shining more and more, and it's been amazing hits. I mean, I mean, James Goss is wonderful in terms of you don't know what you're going to get with him. It can be absolute comedy, and then the following week, absolute fear horror. But 
we keep hitting these amazing ones. And I, I do think dissected in terms of that conversation, two powerful women conversation throughout, drawing on the past and what's happened to both of them, exploring who they are, and then the fear element that came through. It, w- it was an amazing script. And as you said, that it would be perfect on stage. It was just, yeah, it was beautiful. Oh, thanks very much. Yeah, I, um, I mean, I love James Goss. I think he's such a genius. And I am so annoyed at his range as well. It's... Um, so frustrating, but yet so good. But um, the, the the good, the great thing about Goss as well is that he does encourage that experiment uh, experiments, and he, it's just it's it's just a really safe environment to try stuff um, like that story, which would maybe have been a sort of tough sell for a Doctor Who story. So I'm I'm, I'm really yeah really pleased. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Can can I make a confession? I, I went off Torchwood for a little while. Uh-huh. Uh, and it was one of your stories that dragged me back in, and I've oh. never never gone back. Um, it and that's Tropical Beach Sounds. Uh, tell tell us about that. What an amazing story! Such an experimental story, and what a star actor to get in. That must have been thrilling for you too. Again, another s- s- stunning why me moment. But um, but yeah, this uh, this was a, there was a lovely confluence that I had. I was quite unemployed at the time. I'm trying to think of sort of between theatre stuff. And I'd ended up doing my own podcast. And it's not a very good podcast. It's sort of me in a cupboard um, making weird synth noises and taking people on a tour of a foot factory. It's That makes no sense. It doesn't even make sense when you listen to it. You know, if you want to check it out, feel free. But um, Goss had listened to it and really enjoyed it. And he was like, ah, Scott had this idea that we maybe get like a haunted self-help tape. And I feel like we should do it in the version that you've done your podcast in the, in the, the second person, um, taking a, taking people on a journey. So I was like, okay. So I, um, went away and did the script and it is the only script that I have handed in late because I'd finished it. I was looking at him being like, I can't tell if this is, good or just absolutely terrible so I did that thing where you sort of hide it in a drawer and you hope the magical properties of the drawer will make it better and then I get a little chase from Goss being like where where is this script and I'm like oh here it is and luckily he liked it and he you know we had some great um he did some great edits on it and we sort of worked on it and yeah but at that time I still had no idea who we would be getting in for it um but I knew I knew because it was you know, such an economical release, I guess, to be pragmatic. Only the one voice actor. We could get someone quite special. And then when I heard it was Michael Palin, I mean, wow. Sir Michael I, Palin. <laughs> so Sorry, yes, Sir Michael Palin, with his expensive tones, Sir Michael Palin. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was, um, that, was, that was incredible. And it, was, and, it, and it formed a really lovely two days for me when uh, in January... Uh, of 2020 this was when I was like oh 2020 is going to be my year how brilliant so like first maybe the first week of January I went to watch Tom Baker record one of my stories in awe then the next day went listened to Michael Palin who is the loveliest man oh my gosh just such a kind gentleman and just very funny um yeah that was incredible I was just riding on a complete high from Big Finish Productions Torchwood Life is stressful. Life is cruel. Sometimes life is exactly like being shot twice in the stomach while the love of your life dies in a nuclear meltdown. But enough of living like that. Let's make a change. Sit back. Relax. Close your eyes. Listen to the warm, expensive tones of Sir Michael Palin as he takes you through tropical beach sounds and other relaxing seascapes. Volume 4. Can you hear the waves? Can you feel the hot sand beneath your toes? Can you taste the blood? Of course you can. Good. It's time to change the world. It's time to become someone new. Big finish. We love stories. Even yours. I sure that Tom Baker's not coming out for another 20 years? Yes, I think it's scheduled for 31, 23. So uh, (laughs) hold on tight. Speaking of Doctor Who, I I noticed that your first 
a full Doctor Who release that wasn't uh, like a sideline, like Torchwood or Captain Jack or um, Benny Summerfield, was, was was only released recently, and that was the... I don't know if it was the first one you wrote, but um, The Golf uh, came out recently, so that must have taken you back to your UK gold uh, viewing days to, um, to to draw on some of that. Uh, how, was, how was that one for you? So it was my first four parter but like you said I'd, I'd only really um you know written the doctor in the rangers before then and um yeah i was i was a little nervous how to approach the pacing of it because i think you know a two-hour story is very different from a one-hour story and um i really wanted to capture that kind of classic feel of um something that might have you know been in the pertwee era with the sort of cso fringing and yet you know bring what I'd learned from, you know, other rangers as well and having sort of good, interesting, complex side characters. And um, yeah, that was, that was a, that was a, that was a lovely gig. And it was the first time, I think, I think I'm not wrong in saying this. Um, Oh no, not quite. I'd done a couple of times I'm thinking, but, uh, oh no, oh no, maybe. But anyway, I was, um, I had John Dorney as the script editor who's become a, 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 a close writing colleague and he's just a wonderful man and yeah I um, learned so much from him as well in terms of uh pacing and then later when we did a six-part story you know the the art of the cliffhanger and and stuff like that so yeah it was a it was a real learning curve and also it was great to have the you know our new Sarah Jane Smith Sadie um, Miller she's great isn't she Sadie what what yes yeah, what a talent absolutely fantastic um yeah so I yeah I really enjoyed that that's my, you know, you when when you're writing these Doctor Who stories, you, you want to, I don't know, you want to have a play in all the sandboxes, and and one of them is, you know, a base under siege story. One one of them, you know, I'll also want to do like historicals and maybe a, a, a space opera as well. I just imagine getting my action figures out, and you know, what would I have enjoyed ten years ago? So yeah, I had a good time with that one. You can you can once again though feel your theatre background coming in. Because I mean, the whole thing—that the whole thing—could be staged again on a set. Because I mean, that's the thing; it's probably two or three main locations. I mean, I know you've got all the water scenes and the action stuff, but that's not the crux of the story. The crux of the story is characters dealing with their past and their relationships with each other. It's it's a it's a stage show again, isn't it? About humanity. I th- I think that's very true. I think um, I think I. Uh would much rather put you know characters in a room and give them sort of good dialogue back and forth and or at least that's my sort of natural go-to and and it's funny that you talk about the sort of theatrical influences of that because that story in particular was inspired by my going away and living on an artist retreat for a year as I mentioned a while ago and what that does to your creativity and I was drawn on sort of characters that I'd met there and um although you know it's a different medium a lot of them were sort of painters and sculptors uh, on that rig but um but yeah, no, it's. Uh, I th- I think it's definitely my go-to. I think you know, if 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 you know, just give me a couple of great actors. We'll whack them in a room. And we'll have a great time. Now, Big Fish have been using you a lot now as a script editor on that monthly Tortured series. What's the difference between being a script editor and writing your own work? I think there's a lot of uh, difference in the sense that it is um, you are there to serve another person's story and the range as a hold. Um, something James Goss says when I was asking him for tips on how to script edit, he was like, you have to, you have to become the script's best friend, even when the writer themselves hates it. Because we all go through this period where, I mean, I think I've been talking about it. I'm like, this, this script is brilliant. And then moments later, I'll be like, this is terrible. And I guess a script editor is there to be the, you know, to, to be the, 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 the straight and narrow path all the way through the process from beginning to end. I think I largely do script editing on that range for James Goss, who just makes my life 20 times easier. He'll just come up with these outrageous ideas, completely different from the last one. He'll present me with a first draft that's, you know, nearly perfect. So I have to really dig deep to sort of um, um, have anything to say at all. But then it's also lovely as well in those in those early stages being a sounding board for him, talking about which characters he might get back and um, what might happen to them. I think in particular, let's have a think. I really enjoyed script editing Gooseberry because he's 
already built up some, I don't know if you've listened to this story, but it's a, yep. it, it's a Sergeant Andy and Owen story. He's built up something really amazingly with these characters over numerous releases. And when he was first talking about this idea, I was pushing him to make sure it was a story that tested that friendship. Um, because, you know, lots of fans would be listening as it's the next instalment of the Andy and Owen adventures and, and making sure that, you know, he, he drives a wedge between the two of them and, and, and pushing his, uh, uh, the, the darker elements. A good thing as, as, uh, that a script editor can do as well is, is maybe give reference points. Or so Double Indemnity was one that I mentioned for Gooseberry, that kind of um, duplicitness that's always going on in the background and keeping that tension high. So yes, I do, I do a lot of script editing for James Goss. And I've also done some script editing for John Dorney, who again, is just another genius that Big Finish employs. So I do, I do very much cruise through the script editing because the work is just so good coming in to begin with. So I'm just, I, I guess I'm just ultimately the polish man, the sheen man, the making sure it just really pings. Yeah. With Gooseberry, you, you did a similar thing with um, was it recently Yanko's Excellent Barbecue, which was once again, putting two characters together at odds with each other and playing on the relationship of each other and what that means for them, other people they know, but also to drive the story forward. So that was a very similar sort of play with two male leads, wasn't it? Yes, I guess it was. Um, yes, I haven't thought about that. Um, recent Yanto's Barbecue was such a, 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 a last minute story for me. I think I had to pitch it and then ultimately write it in, in two weeks. So it feels like a bit of a blur when I think about that one. But um, But yes, I think like you were saying about the gulf and you know the putting the characters in a in a room and 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 listen to them chat i guess the tortured range does that a lot through necessity you know for budget reasons you can only get so many sort of actors but also because we've got such incredible actors and great complex characters that we've really that they've been given so many layers over the different tv shows that you can have two stories that are sort of side by side that are maybe quite similar the, the barbecue story in Gooseberry. And yet simply through having different characters, they will make sort of radically different choices. And um, I guess then that's in my, in my head why I haven't sort of put the two together. But um, but yes, there's almost like a, a tortured template, I guess. That's fun to then break with stuff like Michael Paling and, and you know, mm. locking Freema in a morgue. So, yeah. Well, it's interesting with um, the barbecue one because Gwen's not present, was the, you know, the, the character's not present sorry what was i was to say the actress isn't in it but gwen is present throughout the whole show she's manipulating driving these other characters even though she doesn't appear so it's interesting that once again because we know the character of gwen so well we can see her in the background of all that's going on which is one of, the, one of those interesting plays that you, you've managed to bring out with that yeah and I, and I think that's um that's something that the tortured range has sort of excelled with as a whole as did the Lake Seven Liberator Chronicles as well, I think, because these you big ensemble things, it's very expensive to get them all in the one room at, you know, at any one time. And and so to then sort of, you know, divvy them up, it means you can focus on maybe like one or two characters, and yet you will still have the rest of the team impacting on the stories as a whole, uh, just through the nature of, you know, how they work and that's just how they operate. So ticking through your doctors, you've now got the 10th doctor. Under your belt as well, in terms of uh, with the oh, oh no, not tenth, not tenth. I've got ninth. Got oh, ninth. sorry, I'm getting tenth, oh. tenth. Still on my list. Don't worry, I've got a dartboard with all their faces on, and I'm like, Michael, no, sorry, Chris Eccleston, number nine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> where's the war doctor falling? Um, <laughs> throwing, up, throwing up my counting. Um, yeah, so Chris Eccleston's sort of cause with the um, the music. Is it the mo- leaf motive? I'm trying to think what it's called. Or fright motif, yes. Fright motif. Um, yeah, how did that come about? Did you get to write for Christopher? Yeah, I, I, I was I was staggered to be asked. I um, it was uh, I haven't done a lot of stuff for the new series, but I got an amazing email from Matt Fitton being like, um, "Will you do it?" It was it was me, Lisa, and Tim X, um, who I know from sort of theatre stuff. Um, yeah, lovely gang to be a part of really humbling to be asked um it was it's the most still to this day the most sordid not sordid uh, secret secret thing i've ever done for, for for big finish um and it wasn't locked down until 
that Sunday announcement. So we were going back and forth with lots of ideas. Um, things were getting tweaked and modified as we were learning what Christopher Eccleston wanted to be doing and exploring with the role. And, and yes, it was only only on that Sunday announcement we get an email from Matt being like, okay, you know, full steam ahead, let's do this. And at the time they were going to be recording in the first week of October. And I think the announcement was in September. So that was a very, very tiny window. Yet for all of us, I asked Lisa and Tim, uh, that writing period didn't feel massively stressful. Um, I think, you know, there was lots of stresses throughout, but it, it, it was something to do with the fact that we had, you know, been thinking about these ideas for so long that, you know, our pens just flowed and the stories came out. But uh, yeah, that was that was great. I'm so glad that Chris Freckleson's back. What a what a talent. From Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who: The Ninth Doctor Adventures, Volume Two. Excuse me. Hello. We do have a tradesman's entrance. I thought I'd try the front door for once. It's echoing. It's echoing. Not quite. It's drawn to sound, then pulls it along in its wake. Stay absolutely still. And that's our cue. Run! Can I see your identification? Absolutely. There you go. Who am I? Detective Superintendent John Smith. Yes, I am. Hello, hello, hello. What's all this then? You're a hotel inspector, but I thought... Can't argue with the paperwork. Every town has a house like this. A house that children whisper about around campfires. A house that people hurry past. A haunted house. I don't know who that am. I don't know who that am. You worried whatever happened to the Andersons is going to happen to you? Who are the Andersons? I don't... I don't know what happened to them. These are the minutes of the dead. I feel... What do you feel? Scared. In a way I haven't felt since... since a very long time. It arrives. As forecast, the resurgence. It arrives. Has the incursant named itself? The Doctor. Repeat that immediately. The Doctor. Something's coming. Something terrifying. Something terrifying. Big finish. We love stories. So, so how many shows did he record in one hit? So he did. He did Nicholas Briggs's three episodes. Then you, you guys, your three episodes. Oh, yes. Yeah, so he, he ended. He ended up not recording until December, and I think it was Nick's Nick's three parter. And then in January, he then did. Three other box sets, I think, maybe. Maybe there was pickups along the way or something. I remember we were maybe first to second week of January. It was interesting to get to your stories because it first, I mean, I, I love Nick's three parter, which was complex and timey wimey and backwards and forwards and was a very different way of dealing with the Ninth Doctor. But your, your three sounded much more like a Russell T. Davis series and you know, one present, one future, one past. Um, to give us the range of the doctors, was it was it a deliberate choice to do do, do that with your box set? Yeah, absolutely. I think because it's such an early box set, um, you know, almost we wanted to go back to basics. Um, yeah, with just a few sort of little tweaks in there. So um, I was uh, aware that we were writing three Russell C Davies stories almost set before he was on the scene. So we were imagining, you know, this is. Doctor Who as it came back in sort of 2003, 2004. And I wanted mine, although mine was a historical, I didn't want a, you know, a historical celebrity, like probably would have happened if it was in the actual Russell T Davies era, just to, I don't know, make the period feel a little rougher or, you know, a little less comfortable because this is, you know, post-war Paris, they've been through such a terrible time. And I, I got to do so much um, fun research, largely brought about by James Goss, who's this turns out to be this big um, expert of the period of straight um, Paris straight after World War II and the new governments they were setting up and the cultures and everything that they were building up. So I, um, yeah, I, I really immersed myself in that. And you can't help but, you know, imagine, oh, yes, it'd be, this is Paris if we had a street in Cardiff that we covered in snow, you know, it was sort of in the way that the Unquiet Dead sort of evoked um, Victorian Cardiff. I was, I was sort of picturing how... Um, um, Paris would have been achieved in similar conditions. But yeah, I think it's very conscious. And I think 
you know, the more he sort of settles in the role, the, you know, we'll be able to go off into different avenues and really explore his doctor. That would be cool. So do you have a passion for jazz? I was quite musical as a kid. I sort of, I, I used to play the clarinet and then I moved onto the saxophone and I joined this sort of jazz group. Um, I have a good ear for music, or at least I did. It's been quite a while now, but um, I was I was way more musical than I was interested in sort of writing. I also played the violin for this orchestra. So yeah, I guess there's, you know, something free flowing about the, the, the format and the, you know, the call and response and the ability to improvise. And again, something else I like in creativity, you can sometimes fall flat on your face. You know, you'll do a solo, you don't quite hit it. That's all right. You've got the next night to do it. Um, it's that sort of creativity is something that is alive and, you know, wobbling around us that I like. Now, your most recent release is uh, Clone Masters, which was a unusual in terms of another box set, except they had you write all three stories. So what I'd love to hear is, I'd, I'd love to hear the process of how did it come about and just tell us how long it took, what were the stages, and yeah, just fill us in with as much detail as you can about the Clone Masters. Yes, well, you know, I've got some notes written here, done my research. To, I've gone through back to um, old emails, checking dates and stuff like that. So feel free to like dive in and ask questions as I go. Um, but yes, so I was first emailed the very end of October and it was a lovely email from David Richardson basically saying, have you seen Blake 7? And I reply back to him being like, oh, yes, I have. And uh, if you do <laughs> anything... in the morning after the pub. <laughs> yes, I was just like, I'm watching it right now. It's 3 a.m. Um, uh, no, I was like, uh, I'd be very interested if you uh, do more Blake 7 stuff. And he, uh, the next day, then he sort of gives a little uh, brief taster of what is to come, which I can't go into too much because this is actually box set one of a sort of three-part bigger story, which may or may not be apparent from if you've listened. Um, but he talks about, you know, the first box set's the Clone Masters, and then he talks that, you know, we've got Colin coming back as Babe and Wow, and uh, the Terran Ostra. And he basically says, how much of this do you want to write? Because a, a really good thing about working with David Richardson is he, you know, he gets to know his writers and he gets to know what they want to do. And I had... Um, after the Gulf, and I was currently writing the Auton Infinity, which is my six-part Peter Davison story coming out next year. Which whew, I'll be very interested to hear people's reactions to that one. But um, I was currently writing that, and I'd expressed an interest. That I was really interested in, in writing longer-form stories because I was I, I wanted to do stuff where you could, um, you know, tell tell slightly more expansive stories dig a little deeper into the characters, give them sort of space to, I don't know, a, a, a space to explore things like maybe, you know, like religious beliefs or relationships that you don't necessarily get time to in a one hour story. So he, he, his email said, how much do you want to write? And I was like, oh, I'd, you know, I'd be up for doing like a two-parter. And he was like, better yet, why don't you just take the Claw Masters box set? See if you want to do that. So I was thrilled. Um, and then he hooks me up with, Peter Angelides, who is the script editor. And I haven't worked with Peter before, um, but I do like a sort of uh, a, a good relationship with a, a script editor. And so then for the next, um, oh, I think for the next week, I'm bouncing emails back and forth with Peter. So, can I go back? Peter... So, so let's go back. So with October, you're contacted and you're given the clone masters in terms of this is the area that I want you to work with? Yes. So... Email the very end of October, and then maybe like the you know first or second of November, David's like, let's focus you on the Clone Masters. I'll hook you up with our script editor. And what Peter has is he has a big sort of document of uh, he's done a lot of research on the Clone Masters. The really good thing about working with Peter, especially for Blake Seven, which I am a fan of, but I'm not as big a fan of it as I am for Doctor Who, so I don't fully know all the ins and outs. But Peter is like a Oh, he's like a living, breathing encyclopedia, really lives and breathes Black Seven. And that was so useful. And so this document that he sends me out at the Clone Masters really sort of digs into the ins and outs of them. Even, you know, they have that tiny appearance in uh, Weapon, but they then, uh, that inspires so many questions uh, from Peter, which he uses as prompts throwing out there. So it'd be a question of like, um, 
uh, the claw masters all seem to be women. Why? Um, you know, Vegetable City, what's all that about? And it was a really useful, um, uh, you know, it, it, it prods and pokes is something I like to do as well for a, for a script editor because it really gets your, your brain juices going and it doesn't close off any avenues. It means everything's, everything's your oyster. So what you do when you um, put in a story, you initially start with, um, you know, pictures or just tiny paragraphs to sort of encapsulate what the story's about. You'll then move on to um, bigger things like outlines. And then obviously the script at the end, because I was doing a box set, that meant I had to have three paragraphs. So first, initially, I sent a document to Peter. When do I send this? I sent a document to Peter, oh, like a week later. Now, Peter's already given me some parameters. So he's saying that the characters I have to play with are, I have Callie, if I like. I could also have Sally, um, if I want Jenna in there. I could have Aurac. Um a couple of suggestions he gives me is he, he says it would be, you know, you could do it all as one big long mission. Um, almost Cali coming from the Liberator and we just never cut away back to the ship as though we would do on TV. Um, he talks about the psycho strategist character, which, um, which will be appearing in later boxes as well. This is Hinton. And um, he talks about, which I won't go into too many specifics about, but he talks to me about what foundations he would like me to put in place for later stories. So I come back to him um, with two different ideas for the box set. So my first idea for the box set is one long story that is largely set, set on the Claw Masters world, which features Callie and her mother. The second story that I have is um, a little more disjointed and it's probably closer uh, in format to what the box set originally became, but with different characters. I always knew that the first story, I would like to do the history of the Clone Masters. I'm a big believer in that sort of Shakespearean format of talking about people before they come on stage sort of really amps them up. So I knew the first chunk of my first story wouldn't really feature the Clone Masters. I wanted them this sort of background shadowy presence was sort of digging around archaeological style. Um, and then we would later move on to the Claw Masters. And yes, it would be sort of Callie and, uh, and her mother, a character I called Landra. I think it's important for me to have um, strong relationships in any stories I like. So I like mothers and daughters or brothers and sisters and the like. And so Peter reads these um, two sets of three paragraphs. And he's like, these are really good. Let's see if we can smush them together. Because I like the sort of thread of Callie and her mother in your first one, but I think it's very important that these feel like three different Blake Seven stories, like your second proposal. And then I, I, I can't determine whether in the emails, whether it's, it's a suggestion from him or I had already made the suggestion, but we do have the question about whether we should have the mother or a sister. The advantages of uh, a mother are, you know, a, a, an unseen character. We do something a little different. I imagined her as, um, you know, what kind of mother would be cloning her children? Is she sort of this cold, distant donor? Is there mileage for emotion there? The good thing about having a sister is, um, well, it's well, it's cheaper. We, you know, we would have we would have Callie doubled twice as the actress. And there's an issue back and forth. Oh, I was going to say it's got a link back to Children of Aaron too, where she has a sister, I think Zelda. So yes. got, in, in Blake's and fans' minds, they've already got a link to a sister. Yes, so a lot of the back and forth we have initially is, is Peter's a little hesitant of um, you know, telling the same story as Zelda. Um, but the more I think about it, the more I'm like, this is a box set about clones. And it's important for me that we don't do stories where or it's not a big turning point that, you know, the, the big question is like, who is the clone? You are the clone. Because I feel like that story has been done before, not just in clones, but also in lots of like Android stories. It's, you know, the, the question of who is the robot? I'm not very interested in that. But, you know, this is, this is a box set about clones. I feel like we could have another sister for Callie and we could do something interesting there. So then we settle on Lara, I think. And by the time I come to 
send three firmer paragraphs for my sort of pitch thing. Lara is locked down. And at the time, the stories are called, let me tell you, first episode is called Division. The second episode is called Dominance. And the third episode is called Descent. They're my working titles. So in this new version, um, we ha- we've got quite similar to what we have in the end. We've got Jenna and Callie exploring the, a distant clone master's ship. In the second story, we have Travis demanding a clone. And then in the third story, we have the great conclave, the, the arrival of a new pope. Not a new pope, but inspired by <laughs> yep. a pope. And um, yeah, so that has Callie. And we realise then, so we can do a nice through line where we have um, Jan in all three stories. In the second one, she'll be Lara. Um, there's initial back and forth between me and Peter. He wants me to make sure that Travis, um, I've written him quite a passive character or quite a pampered character in my initial sort of pitch because I, I have the idea where he just sort of swans in and all the clone masters do what they want. And he's like, make sure that, you know, Travis, this version of Travis is a very demanding character. And um, uh, yes, yeah, so we have those these three paragraphs. So then I then build them up into outlines. And an outline is like a, um, instead of a paragraph, it's like a, it's a page. And different script editors like different things. So for James Goss, he likes his um, outlines to be bullet pointed, whereas Dorney prefers sort of more prose orientated. And I decide to go with sort of bullet points for this Blake 7 because it feels bigger and I just want to sort of make sure that I've hit all the sort of story beats. So let's see when I send these off. I send these out sort of like middle of November. We're working fairly quickly because I know that the aim is to be recording February and I'm conscious that these are three hour long stories, which is 30,000 words. So I'm, uh, I'm, um, I'm just conscious about sort of getting everything done. So I've clarified that I want a big thrust for the box set. That was really important for me to have this one overarching, you know, the queen of the Clone Masters is dead. And as we sort of build up the ideas, stories for, for story one, I realised we're going to need the character of Dr. Sim, because originally it was going to be a bit more of a two-hander, maybe a bit more like dissected, the two of them exploring this empty, abandoned place. And I realised that, you know, that's going to be a bit dull. Um what, uh, what so, are you? What are you told as a writing terms of what the budget will be? How many cast you can have? At, at this stage, are you free to do whatever you want? Or are you told this is this is your this is your budget for casting, and you can't go over this? Well, you're not given budget per se, as in like you know this is the money, but you are encouraged to you know think that you will have either one or two leads, and you'll have um, maybe two or three guest characters, especially for Blake Seven, which is a slightly smaller range than it would be for Doctor Who. But I do quite like thinking, you know, pragmatically. And because I know I'm writing three three stories, I'm already working out how can we get cross-pollination going that the stories maybe feel bigger than they are. So I think in each of the three stories as they ended up, there's little vocal cameos from actors picked up during different recording sessions as they're recording that episode. So, for instance, I think the very first episode both opens... Um, with one of the clone masters doing her grand proclamations of the queen of the clone masters is dead. There's also then a sneaky cameo from the actress who plays Kiz, vocalizing Dr. Kisner in one of the sort of audio recordings. So I, yeah, it's, I, I'm trying to trick you, I guess, as a listener into, you know, thinking the story is bigger than it is and the, or more fleshed out than it is. Each, so each of the stories, like I say, is, is, um, is fleshed out in this outline. For Travis, I don't yet know that we are going to potentially have other Travis. This is not how the idea has been conceived with yet. But, you know, there is this storyline of him getting a clone and, you know, the having a sort of strange back and forth. And I make sure that in my each outline, I am satisfied that we are focusing on three different kind of clone stories. So we have Dr. Sim and her weird divisions. We have Travis and Travis. And then the last story, we'll see Callie confronting Lara. So I've got three different clones to focus on. As per Peter's suggestion as well, I'm going for different tones in these outlines as well. So in our first one, it's almost like a slightly, you know, more Scooby-Doo vibes. You know, we're going for sort of spooky, folkloric, the two of them together prowling around. For my second story... um, um, I'm, I'm, I'm quite uh, inspired by Blade Runner, uh, the sequel, 
especially the, the moments with Ryan Gosling and sort of navigating around that world. Um, something like the version, which I wrote in that, I knew from the off I wanted a weird sort of cryptic rhyme that would come later back to haunt him. Then in the third story, I wanted um, sort of uh, a story with Sheen, despite the fact that we've seen the dark underbelly of the world in the story previously, because I thought there was a nice irony there. I realise as I'm doing these outlines, uh, it, it's funny because as writers, you can um, you can have scaffolding that never makes it into the stories. And one of the scaffoldings for me of the Clone Masters is the Indiana Jones trilogy. I'm thinking the first one, Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, we've got two people exploring sort of spooky things. Temple of Doom, that kind of, I wanted that sort of underground sensation and feeling. And then the third one, the with the with the Holy Grail, you know, the the awe and the majesty of the Clone Masters. That's not something that will, you know, necessarily end up in the final scripts or that I want listeners to be aware of, but that's something that's helpful for me because I feel like I'm writing a trilogy. That's a great trilogy. Let's see if I can sort of use them as, you know, holding posts. Ross T. Davis uses a song and he just plays the same song over and over again, which is the sort of tonal thing, which sounds like the same thing that you're doing. Yeah, I can, I can really see that. I know as well... Um, for something that has not been announced yet, Matt Fitton pointed me in the direction of songs, which I'd never done before, despite being musical. So I was like, oh, that's this is an interesting sort of merging of forms. But um, but yes, so I, I sent off these outlines. There's a bit of back and forth. Yeah, it's just making sure that, you know, um, you know, despite the fact that there's a Cali through line, the first story should feel like a Jenna story. Um, again, to give it that sort of different tone. But then we come up with three outlines that we're happy with. So then we check these with David, the producer. Then he has to check these with the licensees. And um, eventually I'm then commissioned to do the writing. So I'm commissioned at the first week of December. And I'm how, going to be how, del- So how seriously do the licensees care? How, how thoroughly do they read? Do they ever object to anything? Do you know? It, uh, it depends. And it depends on the... Um, well, so for instance, I don't know if he counts as necessarily a licensee, but uh, all most slash all torture stuff goes through Russell T Davies. I think more so than Doctor Who because, you know, he created Torchwood and I, I think he, you know, um, feels very protective over it. Um, but yeah, in terms of the licensees, it's, it's just things about, um, well, for the BBC, for Doctor Who, it's, I guess it's about making sure, you know, that it's reflecting some elements of the show as it is on telly at that moment. So things have to be a bit more family, family friendly at the moment in the Chris Chibnall era, I think, because the TV show itself is family friendlier. Um, so, I mean, it, it's, it's never a situation where they shut down anything outright. I think it's just, you know, somebody keeping an eye on things, just an, ex- on an external line, making sure everything's okay. I don't actually quite know how it worked with the Blake 7 people i don't know if that goes to sort of the terry nation estate but i know they're very friendly with big finish anyway with um the likes of dalek universe and stuff so i think there's also an element of trust there they know that it's sort of it's in safe hands with big finish and david so yeah yeah so no objections thankfully and i'm commissioned first week of december so i have two months less than two months i have six weeks really because it's mid january i have six weeks to um write thirty thousand words which is a bit terrifying, but also not, because at the same time, I'm just finished writing my six-parter autumn story. And I've got into a really good rhythm there of writing effectively what was half an hour a week. Uh, and so I know I can do the sort of similar approach with the Clone Masters, despite the fact it's three hours, I can do sort of half an hour a week and six weeks is fine. However, going through my emails, I did have to get a week extension because we were in lockdown three by this point in, uh, in the UK. And I, 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 I must admit, I did not have a laptop at this point in my writing career. I use things like sort of tablets or just sort of like borrowed stuff, or I do a lot of handwriting. And uh, I was sharing with my partner, and he's a teacher, and he needed it to teach lessons. So I have to email uh, David and Peter very apologetically and say, <laughs> you know, I'm sort of struggling here. I email two weeks in advance because I can just sort of sense knowing my own rhythms it's going to be a bit tight so I get a week's extension and so yes then I I saw an extension for the 21st and then I hand in all three scripts on the 21st 
bang on, new deadline. So I can still say I hit the deadline. It was just a new one. And then it's very swift, the process that then follows with Peter. He's he's happy with the scripts. He thinks they're in fairly good shape. Um, we sort of operate on a, a very swift principle where he, he does notes on one. He sort of hands them in that afternoon. I'll have done the notes that afternoon and evening, and I'll hand him email a new script that evening. And then he'll have the new script in the morning. But he's moved on to the next story uh, already. So we kind of get through rewrites in the first week. Um the biggest section to rewrite is the end of episode three, just um, largely the uh, when all the sort of revelations are coming out and we were just sort of tweaking the staging, as it were, I guess, of um, Callie and um, Travis coming in and the Clone Masters talking at them. Because for audio drama, you don't want a scene to be really longer than four pages. Um, I learned that very early on with Poker Face, which was one of my Among Us scripts, when one of the actors, who I shall not name, but they grumbled that a script that I had written did not fully fit on a stand. And I realised that that's, um, it's both a, a physical limitation and also a, a mental limitation. You don't, want, you don't want scenes that go on for ages. Like I was saying with Dissected, you can lose a lot of energy if you know nothing's changing about the environment or the situation. But this one last scene that I had was just proving very tricky to sort of navigate because, you know, they're in the big, you know, they're about to announce the new Clone Master Queen and um, we've got a lot to get through. So Peter helps me sort of divvy it up into moments where, although it may not be audible, well, I'm writing the scripts as though they're in sec different sections of the room. So we're focusing on Callie and Travis, and then we're focusing on our Clone Masters, who I imagine are on some kind of stage. So that's the big sort of wangling we have to do that script. But then, yes, by the end of January, the scripts are done, and they managed to record in February. It was it was it was a lovely process, um, especially because Peter, I'd never, like I said, never worked with him before, but um, ex ex you know, exceptionally helpful guy and a very forensic script editor as well so when I was you know initially um, firing off my um, paragraphs and outlines to him he would come back with some very detailed notes where we would be working out together um, what elements we wish to explore so he he really helped me build the character of Lara Kay um, he was then also very excited when sort of after I'd handed in my first outline to tell me that this story could work with you know, other Travis, if we bulk up other Travis's role, which delighted me because, I, you know, I thought there was a great deal of mileage there. And uh, yeah, it, it was it was a, it was a really, really fun process. Speaking of Lara, I recall from the extras you saying that you originally wrote Lara with different kind of syntax. She wasn't using contractions so you could differentiate the characters, but then Jan Chappell came in and said, well, maybe she can change her voice. At what, what stage was that? Had she looked over the script beforehand or did that all happen during the recording? I think, I think that happened at the recording. So I know the, um, I know the actors get the scripts in advance and they each have their different processes about how they wish to prepare. It heartens me when, you know, occasionally you'll get the producer email and saying, oh, this actor's preparing the script. They just want to say, you know, they're really enjoying this or they have questions for this. I know during the process for this, um, which of the Travises? I think it was Brian, give Peter a ring to talk through the role. He was like, I'm really enjoying this. I'd just like to know um, uh, these questions. Can you help me talk me through this? Um, so that was really lovely. But yeah, I think um, I know, I've known from past experience that it's difficult to have doubling in audios unless you modulate or change the voice, you know, maybe put them behind a plane of glass or uh, have them on the telephone or something. It's just, it's a bit confusing for the listener. You can do it for sort of short extracts, but it's a little tricky. Um, and so that's something that Peter helped me, you know, write her syntax slightly differently. But then, yeah, I think, you know, just um, Jan's decision, I think really helps with the clarity of it. And also just gives that character, you know, a little sharper edge as well I really liked hearing it and I never got confused I mean I knew I wouldn't get confused as well when we were discussing this is something that came up as well when we were discussing whether mother or sister I just listened to I think it's Wolf um maybe one of the Liberated Chronicles and it is just you know Jan 
doing lots of voices as you know actors do but I was really impressed at her range and I then felt you know having heard that I felt very confident that we could write you know great scenes between her and her sister that wouldn't feel like that wouldn't be confusing and uh yes I'm really I'm pleased with the end result there just on on the Travises as well at when the artwork for the cover was released a few months prior we sort of got a clue as to what was going on with uh, with the Travises there but I did notice someone online made a comment in some forum I was reading where they were they felt that that they must have missed something with the explanation for the for the Travises they said oh is that the only explanation there is because it's it's a slightly ambiguous explanation about uh, why the Travises look different um, but it's still for me it was yes it was ambiguous it was open to a lot of uh, interpretation but it was still satisfying so when you said that there's a, a, a sort of a bigger arc in the coming box set so we're going to explore that a little bit more is that is that something we can look forward to or is it still top secret um I don't know what I can say I'm not involved in writing of the other two box sets so I don't know uh for sure but I would just say yeah, and uh, I couldn't possibly comment. Is that the is that the official line? Um, it's it's funny you mentioned that. Um, th- there was a there was a lot more um, heavy lifting I was doing when they first met each other, the Travises, and um, Peter quite rightly pointed out that I was doing a bit too much wink, wink, nudge, nudge to the audience, where you know there was more lines where Travis was like, "He doesn't look anything." Blah, 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 blah. Better lines than that, maybe I can't quite remember what they were, but um, because Peter you know, has his plans. He was able to sort of, you know, say we don't have to do too much heavy lifting here. And also we don't want to interrupt the, oh, the sort of, you know, the the creepy unnerving aspect of that episode too, where, you know, Travis knows that he's occasionally on the back foot and doesn't quite know why. And, you know, just slowly gaslighting the character as well. So, um, so yeah, I, you know, I don't know what's coming up apart from little hints and here and there and what I was asked to set up. So you know, let's have this conversation in like when we finish this box set range. That'll be good. Sounds, sounds good. Just just in terms of just one other thing in terms of the boring mechanics of being a writer. When do you get paid? When you deliver your episodes, or along the way, or how do they how do they pay you? Yeah, you get you get paid two installments. You get paid on signature, and then you get paid on delivery. And so that moment when you are contracted is, you know, I guess it's an important one because that's when you, you know start getting paid and you can start making time and space to write these stories. Um, I think as well, that's why I think it's good and healthy to develop um, a a brain that can switch between projects because in writing today, and this isn't just audio, I think this is most formats and especially theatre, no one gig can pay you for all that long or sustain you for all that long. It is a, a balancing act. And so you know, you're, you're taking on different commissions here and there, knowing that you aren't necessarily going to get fully paid for this one until you're completely done. So you're then relying on the payment of one that you've done previously to come in at the right time to sort of buy those cups of coffee that you'll be desperately be needing all the way through. So, yeah, it's, it is interesting that, you know, writing isn't necessarily just about the writing. It's also about the... Um, the, your financial infrastructure around you, making sure that you are in a position to be able to write. And I think that's what forms a barrier for people who are new at writing and want to give it that sort of time and space and can't take the plunge yet because it's tricky because they can't just sort of quit their job. I did, um, when I was working in pubs in London, I would sort of uh, be writing on the end of the bar in my notebook. And I guess that sounds very romantic, but it was very impractical, you know, it's it's late nights, you're tired, your brain's elsewhere. You really want to, as I said at the beginning, you want the time, the space and the money. And yeah, I guess it's just about sort of building up that financial momentum that you can hop from one paycheck to the other as a freelancer. How many writers manage to, I don't know, create that work that will actually sustain them for the rest of their career? You know, the, 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 the J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter masterpiece where it, she, she doesn't never to run again. And she's going to be pulling in millions with every new book and sales. There's, there's the odd playwright, the odd Willie Russell or someone who no doubt has enough works constantly being revisited and put on again. Uh, yeah, how, how many writers can actually have that luxury? I mean, I, I, I couldn't possibly say it. I can't imagine that many in this climate. 
I mean, you mentioned playwrights. I can only think of one playwright at the moment, maybe a, a guy called James Graham, who can survive simply by being a playwright. It is quite perilous. Well, so for instance, let's break it down. A theatre play, for a full-length theatre play, I think you know equity minimums run about eight grand. And if you did two of those a year, you'd be on sort of 16K, um, which in, in UK is below minimum wage, I think. And, you know, that's quite tricky. H- having said that, you're never going to get commissioned two plays a year. That's that's bonkers. It's, and uh, I have a play going on next year that I first wrote in 2016. It's this, this you know, theatre is this sort of slow um, turning of cogs. And, you know, I got paid for that play eons ago now. It's pre-COVID times. I can't even remember when. And um, again, yeah, no, if I was surviving on that, I'd be, uh, I'd be just sort of eating cereal without the without the milk, which I still do sometimes. You know, when things are lean between the months. But um, no, I think, um, I think, I think it's impossible these days, or largely impossible. And I think slowly people are waking up that, you know, you, it's very difficult to be a writer full time, and you need more strings to your bow. Um, and uh, I. I I hope people don't feel like they are failures when they take on, you know, side work beyond their writing. I've definitely gone through periods where I've done temping of offices. I did more pub work, um, working in cafes. Um, I once even did a, uh, where I was lying on a slab and doctors would come and sort of draw lines on my body where they would show, where they would do um, breast implants on me. This was sort of (laughs) teaching staff how to do this. So that was, you know, a fun couple of days. But um, yeah, you know, um, I, I think for a lot of my peers, a lot of write, writing as well is just is the graft of making a living and, you know, making good work as you do that. I'm very lucky that I've largely through a combination of Big Finish and theatre things that I have going on. I am in a position where I can write full time and, it, you know, it is great for my mental health. It is it is great for my work, I think. Um, but yeah, no, it's 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 very difficult, very difficult at the moment. But you have a heap of stuff about to be released. You've got a story <laughs> in the Martha Jones range. You've got a story in the Stranded range. You've got Peladon coming out. Uh, a story in the Lone Centurion, and then you've got the Fifth Doctor. And what are you most ex- excited about us hearing? I think oh. It's like when, whenever I write a big finished script, as I'm writing it, I'm like, oh, this one's my favourite. I love this one. I, I think I can find a little bit to love in all of them. I'm really excited for the fifth Doctor Six part, parter just because I know how wild that one gets. And it is also a culmination of a box set previously. So, um, so yeah, I'm really pleased with that one. And that one was a definite um, uh, learning curve for me and a great experience because I was working alongside John Dorney, who you know, taught me a thing or two about writing six-parters, how to sort of sustain them, the art of the cliffhanger. I don't think anyone can write a cliffhanger quite as well as John Dorney can, but I've definitely tried in this coming box set. Let's see, uh, Lone Centurion. Oh, I mean, you know, Arthur Darville. Also, I love working with Scott Hancock. I think he's such a writer oriented director. It's always a privilege. Peladon. Just wait till you hear the cast for my Peladon story. That's all I'll say. That blew me away. I had such fun writing it and then... David Richardson emailed me the cast list and I literally gasped. Wow. Um, and then Martha and Stranded. Yeah, I mean, the Martha one I, I, I wrote, I feel like I wrote that decades ago as well. That that one's, that's a box set that's sort of taken a while to come to fruition. Um, and the Stranded, I, I wasn't annoyed by the Stranded, but I am a big Eighth Doctor fan and I was following along the range. I was like, midway through one of the ravenous box sets so when I got asked if I wanted to write standard it was a both leap of the heart and then also ah oh, well you, you're gonna have to then spoil what happens for me aren't you I'm gonna have to uh gonna have to be told what's gone on before so I can tell you what goes on next um but no it was it was it was great to be part of that and um you know the eighth doctor's always felt like this great ongoing range and so I'm I'm really pleased to have played a tiny tiny role in that and what about your life? What's, what's your big dream? If you could write anything, produce anything, what is, what's your... Ooh, what a question. Well, I mentioned I have a play on next year and it's a play that's very close to my heart and it was going to be going on before COVID got cancelled. Didn't think it would see the light of day. And they are now just about to announce it again. And at the moment, 
that is my dream. I can't like I cannot believe that the script that I have worked on for so long and was then cancelled has had this second lease of life, and I'm really excited for it. I'm going to be working with some really exciting people, and um, yeah, I guess I'm you know in this current climate, I'm a bit nervous about making theatre again. So I'm really looking forward to you know getting rid of those nerves and being back in a creative communal space once more. But yeah, no, I just. I guess I just want to be, always be in a position where I can be writing fun stuff, where I can be challenged. Like something like the Clone Masters, the, getting the chance to write a big three hour long story was was great. And I feel like I learned lots as I as I do it. And so I hope I hope I just keep on getting to do that leapfrog from project to project and find something to love in all of them. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. It's been great to hear what you've been up to. Well, thanks for having me, and I hope I didn't ramble on too much. I do tend to go on, but uh, no, it's been lovely. From Big Finish Productions. The Year of Martha Jones. I know you're scared. We're all scared. That's why I'm doing this. To remind us all of a time when we weren't, when we used to tell each other stories. About hope. About freedom. That's why I've been telling you about the Doctor. Okay, we're docking. I'll have to get away before they check the hold. Remember, whatever happens, however dark it gets, remember the stories I've told you, all the way from Yokohama. Hold on to them and spread the word. Maybe I'll see some of you again. Keep your ear to the ground. If I find somewhere safe, you might get to hear some more stories. my cue. Water looks cold. San Francisco Bay, here I come. Look after each other and remember the doctor. Miss Beecham, she's here. Martha Jones is here. Big Finish. We love stories. Ah, oh, well, Philip, that was a great chat we had with Tim Foley. Uh, I've got to say, I'm so grateful to Tim. Thank you for going through that process of uh, writing and how it, how it works. I know, Philip, how you like to break these things right down, get into the nitty gritty. I hope you enjoyed that too. Yeah, I just wanted to get a bit of understanding of what is the whole process for the writer from go to woe. It's, it's still a really short process when you think about it. I mean, the first contact in October and produced and being recorded by February is a pretty speedy process, but it was interesting seeing, you know, this is the breakdown, how it works bit by bit. So yeah, it was fascinating to hear. So thanks for that, Tim. Yeah. No, great stuff, great stuff. And yeah, so, so we're both pretty satisfied now that we've heard the Clone Masters and I, I was unaware that it was that it was going to be part of a bigger arc, although there were questions that were left unanswered that had me thinking. I thought the whole purpose of this was to uh, tie up some of the comments made in Series 3 about the, the Clone Masters and what their fate was. Uh, but it seems that there is uh, there is a bit more in the grand plan of Steve Angelides. Yes, there is obviously. Though that's something. Oh, sorry, think... Peter Angelides. Let's get the names right. Yes, though I suspect um, we may have heard a bit more than has been released at the moment. So there's a bit of a scoop in there, I think, for some of our listeners, if they were paying attention. <laughs> very good, very good. All right, let's go to our recommendations for this week. And if I am not mistaken, whose turn is, is your turn to go first? Oh, that's a shock. Um, so anyhow, I have had a listen this week to, I think it's by Candy Jar. So it's uh, called Units of the Benson Files. Um, so Tim Camb- Gambrell, who wrote uh, one of the Blake 7 audiobooks that I listened to recently, and I actually tweeted something along, and he tweeted me back. Mm-hmm. And so we've been having a bit of a conversation. And so I was aware that he'd also written a story for these uh, unit Benson Files, so I went searching for that. So I listened to that this week. Uh, it's a really, actually, it's a great story. It's actually the first introduction of Benton to Unit. So it's post uh, the Web of Fear, but it's just before the invasion. Oh, and right. 
And so, um, with no spoilers, B- Benson gets brought in to meet the Brigadier by a, a, an army mate of his, who's a, an officer, who's already working for units, and he needs a special, a special sharpshooter, a sniper, and someone he can trust. And so he asks permission from the Brigadier to bring in a friend of his, which is Private Benson. Benton. And it's the story of his Benton's first experience with meeting an alien um, who's not from Japan, but actually <laughs> from wider than Japan. It's it's a it's actually a fun story, um, read by John Levine, and I I love hearing John work. He doesn't he hasn't done a lot of work for Doctor Who. He's only sort of came back in the fold. Um, Big Finish got him to come back. I think for one of the final companion chronicles they did, they finally talked him into coming and doing it, and that is a wonderful companion chronicle piece. Like a James Bond, said in you know, this I find that strange one. that he's done so little because whenever I see him on anything, he's just so enthusiastic. Maybe that's the issue. Maybe he's too enthusiastic. I think it's a lack of uh, security. Actually, I think a lot of really, really? We, yeah. As, as I listen to him and have read a bit about him, I think he feels very insecure at, as himself as an actor. Okay. Um, you know, he, he, I mean, you know, he first came to the show dressed up as a yeti. And he was just a sort of a background artist who sort of got thrust to the forward for the invasion because someone else was sick. And so he picked up the lines on location. And it's just that the audience took a shot because he's just got such a warm, lovely nature. And so I do know that John Pertwee spent a lot of time with him going through lines and helping him uh, improve as an actor. But I do wonder whether how much of that he was actually feeling insecure. Because, I mean, really, I don't think he did much, if anything, after Doctor Who. But it's, so it's, it's been lovely having him come back. He's done a unit, um, unit reassembled for the, the, the new unit box series. But yeah, it was great having him come and read this. But he really gets into it. He just has a warmth to him, which is lovely. So highly recommend Units, The Benton Files, uh, read by John Levine, by Tim Gambrell and John Peel. Excellent. So this is, uh, this is a short story? How long does it go for? About half an hour. Okay. So there's, there's two stories. So it's like a short trip. It's like a short trip. There's two stories on the CD. On the oh, 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 CD, I'm starting to show my age now. On the download, <laughs> <laughs> there's two, two stories. Um, so one by Tim Gambrell, one by, by John Peel. But to be honest, I haven't seen the John Peel yet. But the Tim Gambrell is worth it. Very good. We'll put Just links in the show notes. Great. What about you? What have you been listening to? Well, I'm going to do some shameless, not self-promotion, but almost self-promotion. I'm going to do some shameless promotion of a relative who sent me a message the other day. Uh, One of my cousins is a musician based in Melbourne, and he has a band uh, which is right up my alley, uh, very progressive, uh, sort of the heart of progressive metal, symphonic metal uh, type band uh, called Anavalix, or Anavilix, Um, and I'll put links to this in the show notes as well. Uh, He's just released a brand new album uh, called Iungo, and uh, if I do say so myself, he's a mighty fine musician and vocalist. So uh, uh, I, I urge you to check it out. In fact, because uh, I reckon I'd be able to get away with it this time, I'm going to throw a clip of one of his songs in right here. Here you go. <laughs> So that's Anna Vyx, uh, my cousin. Go and support him. Listen to it on Spotify. I'll stick a link into the show notes. to You can listen to the whole album there. Sounds uh, fantastic, Dwayne. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I, I, I know that's the kind of thing that's right up your alley too. It's oh. so close to musical theatre. Um, it, uh, <laughs> y- you know, it'll make your knees knock. That's for sure. <laughs> All right. So that's, uh, that's my recommendation for this week. And... Uh, 
what a fantastic show. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Philip, for joining me. Thank you for uh, arranging our chat with Tim. It's been great. It's been great. Thank you, Dwayne. Thank you, everyone. Talk to you soon. And we'll catch you next time. Toodles. Bye. This has been The Sirens of Audio, Episode 84, Topical Writing and Other Relaxing Deadlines, Volume 4, with our special guest, Tim Foley, and your hosts, Philip Edney and Dwayne Bunny. Theme music by the Jackpot Golden Boys. Our email address is sirensofaudio at gmail.com. Be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube and your favourite podcast app. Our Facebook, Twitter and Instagram handles are all at Audio Sirens. And our website is sirensofaudio.com. And when you're looking to expand your universe, whether Torchwood, Doctor Who, Blake 7 or if you have some other nostalgic itch, Keep listening to quality audio drama, because audio drama...